I, uh, I run a lab at the MIT Media Lab uh, called Playful Systems. I also I had a game company here in New York uh, that became the New York office of Zynga um, and worked in a bunch of other things before that. But um, not going to talk about games today. Uh, I'm actually going to focus uh, on a sort of uh, tangent that is um, sort of comes out of that, that uh, has become of increasing interest to me over the years, which is um, basically about algorithms, which seem obscure. Uh, broadly, but the ways that they've come to sort of um, infect and affect and inform and sort of shape uh, culture around us. And um, I said that I wasn't going to talk about games today, but I am actually going to talk about one. Um, uh, this is Core Wars. How many people have played this? So that's the most I've ever seen in a room was one person played at once. Um, uh, this is not a, well, it's, uh, it's called Core Wars. This is a game that started in 1984. There's about 10,000 people, it's still being played. There's about 10,000 people who play it at any given time. Um, this, is, uh, this is a game, it's a two-player game. Uh, this is a game in which uh, one person writes an algorithm, uh, and then the other person writes an algorithm, and then they go into combat, usually lasts about 45 seconds, and then one of them wins. This is a very famous match within the community. This is uh, Dwarf Scout versus Little Factory. This is 1991. And this is where Dwarf Scout engages in a memory buffer overflow. That was the exciting part right there, OK? <laughs> so, so this is not, this is not a popular game. Um, uh, it's a game by programmers for programmers. Um, and uh, it's hard to imagine it becoming popular because it's totally, totally abstract. Or maybe it's not at all. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, and I'm going to start here. Um, I'm going to tell you uh, a bunch of stories uh, uh, to sort of lead into the heart of the thing. And this is a story that begins here. This is Holland in the 20s. This is, uh, this is about 1925. Uh, and Holland understands uh, that the airplane has been invented. They also understand that all the airplanes that will be arriving in Holland will not be of friendly intent eventually. Uh, they were quite right about that. So they started developing uh, machines to listen to the air so that they could hear airplanes approaching before they arrived. And then they kind of uh, made like a mainframe version. Uh, and then Moore's Law kicked in, and it started to shrink down. And then a personal version was built. Uh, and then uh, uh, it sort of gets uh, increasingly efficient until you get to hear the mobile version, uh, personal informatics. And this is a funny picture, right? The idea that you would comb your hair in preparation for the shoot um, uh, uh, is sort of fascinating. And it's very funny, except that, of course, um, uh, their concern was totally real. Um, their concern was what everybody's concerned with, which is how to find out what's going to happen before it happens to us. And so that's what these stories are about. Um, there's, there's, these are all sort of going to be stories about that desire, uh, maybe that need or that urge, uh, and how that's come to play out, uh, and how that's come to shape who we are and what we do. Um, uh, in response to uh, the Dutch innovations of the 20s, uh, we build uh, radar. Um, and, uh, uh, and I guess, I guess if there's one through line uh, that I'm gonna that I'm gonna try to reiterate, it's that you know, starting here maybe with radar, um, uh, it's this idea that Paul Virilio uh, talks about, or he quotes anyway, uh, which is uh, that the invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. Um, uh, and so here. Uh, radar solves for the threat of strategic bombing and then makes it impossible if that's, you know, maybe your game, uh, as it is uh, for the United States, uh, uh, you know, which could no longer engage in strategic bombing without being detected ahead of time. And so the United States spent uh, uh, a lot, a lot of time and a lot of money developing uh, stealth technology to completely uh, evade radar. Um, so this is the F-117, one of the crappiest planes uh, ever built uh, in, uh, in the 20th century. Uh, uh, that was designed to uh, completely evade uh, any radar uh, and uh, did that uh, super effectively until it stopped doing that. Uh, uh, this is Kosovo. Uh, this is in 1999. This is the F-117 invisible airplane uh, downed by uh, Serbian rockets. Um, this is a crash, by the way, that nobody can explain. Uh, it's a crash that could never have happened because the only language we had for stealth and stealth technology and stealth evasion was that this can never happen. And the language sounds something like this, that if you have an airplane uh, and somebody hits it with a radar, uh, it's not just going to pass through. That's about 52 tons of, uh, of metal moving through the sky. And the radar signal isn't just going to move right through it. 
Um, but so that's why it's shaped like that. Uh, that's why the, the coding is like that. Um, uh, because it says, okay, you can't, you can't say that there is no big thing there. What, if, what you can do is you can take the big thing, and if you can find a way through its shape and form and chemical dynamics uh, of the coding, if you can take the big thing and break it up into a lot of little things, right, like say a flock of birds, it means that if you're a radar, you've got to look for every bird in the sky, right? And if you're a radar, that's a really bad job, right? So how did this happen? So I used to actually, in the 90s, uh, I did work for Lockheed Martin, and I happened to be there uh, the day that that plane was shot down. Uh, and there was totally this big shoulder shrug. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and it wasn't actually until years later, and I happened to be, I happened to meet a guy who was a Hungarian physicist. Uh, and, uh, and I, you know, we're about the same age, and I was asking him, so what did, what did physicists do uh, uh, in Hungary during the Cold War? Uh, and he said, mostly we worked on stealth. And I said, so, like, making the Hungarian stealth program? Like, how did that work? And he said, no, we were breaking it. Uh, he, said, he said, that's what we did. Um, uh, he said, we, uh, and I said, well, that's, you know, the, how's, how is that possible? How do you break stealth? And he said, well, you know, everything's designed to, uh, to evade radar, and we knew that that was, uh, that that was happening. And we knew that there were, we couldn't just change radar to make it visible. Um, and he said, so what we did was we just started looking for electrical signals as they moved through the sky. And if we, we made a black box to look for electrical signals to move through the sky, and if we saw an electrical signal moving through the sky that had no radar signature, we thought, that probably has something to do with the Americans, right? <laughs> and, I, and I was like, okay, so, um, and so, so and, he, and he said, you know, like the bottom line, he said, is, is that if you want to make something visible, you just have to learn how to look. And I said, well, that's super impressive because you've negated about 60 years of aeronautic research the United States has done. So, like, what'd you do when you grew up? You know, like, what's your act two? And he says, um, financial services. And I was like, oh, you know, financial services, because those are in the news lately. And, um, and I said, so what do, what do physicists do uh, on, uh, on Wall Street? What's the black box of Wall Street? And he says, well, that's funny, because it's actually called black box trading. It's sometimes known as algo trading. Um, and it's this idea that, in fact, large institutional traders, whether they're Goldman or you know, wherever your mortgage is or your, I don't know, your pension, stuff like that, um, whoever they are, they're moving, you know, millions and millions of shares in the market all at once. And the thing is, is, is that they have effectively, once you start moving, uh, you know, like that many shares all at the same time, um, uh, uh, they have the same problem that the United States Air Force does, right? Which is that if they, if they show all of their shares moving through at the same time, if this big thing shows up in the market, everybody sells or buys accordingly, right? So they engage in a form of financial camouflage, right? They take their huge trades and they break them up into like millions and millions of tiny trades, same way the United States Air Force does, to try to get them to move through the market undetected, okay? Now here's the gag, right? Is, is that, of course, the same math that you use to conceal a big trade like that is the same math that you use to detect a big thing moving through the market, right? <laughs> same as the Hungarian physicists did. So if you need to imagine what's happening in the stock market now, like with, you know, things like your pension or your mortgage or whatever it is you have in there, right, what you can imagine is about 70 to 75 percent of any of the trades that are going on are basically big algorithms that are trying to hide themselves as they move through the market, and then a bunch of predator algorithms that are trying to seek those out and shoot them down, all right? And, you know, what could go wrong? Right? Flash crash. You know, um, it's, uh, it's been... It's, uh, to this day, like the, uh, like the Lockheed Martin uh, crash um, uh, a couple years earlier, um, not fully explained. No clear consensus on exactly what happened there. If you missed it, it was in 2010. Uh, it was also known as my favorite name for it, the crash of 245, uh, because it only lasted five minutes, five minutes in which the stock market lost about 10% of its value, where Procter & Gamble traded at $99,000 uh, in one second and a sixteenth of a penny uh, in the next second. Uh, actually, a second is a long time in there. Um, so stock market loses about 10%, uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the really jarring thing uh, in all of this on a sort of, you know, grand uh, theoretical level is, is that nobody even could say why, because all we had left at this point is just sort of, you know, monitors with big numbers moving up and down and a big red button that said stop. Right. So here we are. And it's 2013, and what we've done collectively is we've written something unreadable. 
we've written something that we can ourselves no longer read. And you see this play out in the market way, way, way more. Unless you're actually in that industry, it's way more than you think, right? This was the, uh, all of this because there was gonna be a better alternative to the kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat of trading that you used to see uh, in downtown Manhattan. Uh, we invented something called the Better Alternative Trading System, sometimes known as BATS, a terrible name for stock trading, by the way. Uh, uh, when they went to IPO their own stock, uh, they control about 10% of the market, uh, they crashed the market. Uh, and, uh, and basically their own stock went from uh, $16 to a 50th of a penny within about a second. And they said, okay, you know what, pull it. And they pulled their own IPO. <laughs> they just went offline. And the thing is, is, is that they went offline but that software is still running. Um, and so, you know, night, this is a couple months later, uh, the, uh, night trading, uh, another 11% of the market just whoop, goes away. They take $440 million in useless tickets because their software had an error in it, uh, which was actually um, uh, buying high and uh, uh, selling low. Uh, uh, it was sort of, the, you know, the exact opposite of what, and it was, just, it was just test software that they accidentally deployed to the live server, and the live server is called the economy. Okay, so $440 million in debt. Um, and you know, this is the kind of thing that just happens uh, just about all the time. And the crazy part is, is, is that nobody really understands what is happening. And the thing for me is, is that we took something like, um, we took like, we took like biology, and we applied a whole bunch of really heavy number crunching to it, and we got the genome, right? And we took physics, and we crunched, and we crunched, and we crunched, and we got the Higgs boson, right? But we apply it to something like finance, and all of this, which was supposed to make it more legible, that was supposed to make it comprehensible, has instead made it more opaque than it's ever been in human history. Right? So there's data scientists up in Chicago, these guys called Nanex, and this is all they do, is they just reach into the market and they try to understand what's going on, even though nobody's in charge anymore, even though there's really no adult supervision. Uh, um, uh, and they look around and they root around and I don't know how they do it exactly, but sometimes they can find algorithms moving through the market and when they find them, they do what we always do when we find things that don't have clear provenance, right? Which is that they give them a name and a story. Uh, this is one that they call the knife. <laughs> this is the carnival. This is the Boston shuffler. The castle wall. Twilight. And you know, like maybe it's just me, but I look back at Dwarf Scout and Little Factory, this famous match from 1991, and maybe it's not abstract at all. Maybe uh, this wasn't, uh, uh, maybe this is no abstraction. Maybe this is an audition. Maybe this is a rehearsal for 25 years later when the war that these two algorithms are fighting become real with a couple billion dollars on the line. So if you want to picture what's going on in the world, you can picture Dwarf Scout and Little Factory and the carnival and the knife and the flash crash and the bats crash. And you know, there's this thing that, um, this has actually happened, these types of crashes have happened in the last five years, I don't know, you would probably guess, I don't know, 10 times, maybe 20 times, and the actual number is 18,000. The actual number is 18,000. They might not affect you because you're not running an IPO in there, uh, or you're not sort of paying care careful attention, but it's about 18,000 times unexplained crashes in the stock market. There was one just the other day. And so when I listen to all the arguments about big data and how awesome, predictive analytics are gonna be, you know, there's this quote from Chris Anderson, with enough data, the numbers speak for themselves, and it's like, yeah, well, 18,000 is a pretty strong number. Right? <laughs> and because you can see this, right, like the thing is, and the, uh, sort of the important thing about this is, is that this isn't just the stock market, this isn't just a finance story, right? You can see this on Amazon, you can see this, this is a book uh, called The Making of a Fly, this is a book about uh, the genetics of flies, uh, it's out of print. Um, and it is sometimes hard to find. Uh, you might have seen it listed for $1.7 million, and you would have done well to purchase it, because about an hour later, it was $23.6 million. <laughs> um, what you see there on Amazon is the evidence of two algorithms from booksellers, from used booksellers. Two algorithms, Dwarf Scout, Little Factory, The Carnival, The Knife. Two algorithms in conflict with no human supervision. All right? And you can see this anywhere you look once you learn how to look. It is, in fact, what's determining what you watch, okay? This is pragmatic chaos. This is the algorithm that's inside Netflix, okay? So it's 20 million, there's probably many of them are in this room who use Netflix to figure out, uh, to, to watch things and to also to figure out what to watch, right? So there's an algorithm every time you watch something on Netflix, it says, okay, uh, we'll run pragmatic chaos. And the thing is, is that of the 20 million people who are watching, the thing that they will watch next is determined by this set of algorithms 60% of the time. 
60% of what 20 million people watch is determined by an idea about the human firmware and taste. All right? And you know, what happens if it's not just applied to what we think about the movies, but also how they get made? So a bunch of quants from London uh, who thought, you know what, we've done an awesome job to the market, let's take it to Hollywood. And they move to Hollywood, uh, and they employ what they, or they, just, they sort of build out what they call story algorithms, and you can feed a script in to the Epigogics movie engine, uh, and it will tell you just from the story, just from a, an analysis of the script, never mind who's in it, never mind who's casting it, whatever, this is a $5 million movie, a $50 million movie, or a $500 million <laughs> movie, okay? This is in use, this is in use. And the thing is, is, is that if these algorithms crash, how would we know? Right? We'd just be watching shitty movies all the time. Right? <laughs> and you know, the thing is, is, is that like, what if you don't just automate the reviews, and what if you don't just automate the analysis of the story? Right? What if you could automate the actual writing of the story? So that's happening. Okay, so this is back in Chicago. Uh, this is a bunch of guys called uh, Narrative Science. Anybody heard of them? Yep. Yeah, okay, one or yeah, two people, three people, all right. So uh, these are the guys that have a bunch of algorithms that can basically take a bunch of data and spit a story out that, believe me, will fool you, especially if it's a sports story or a finance story. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, uh, they, and you will see these in newspapers. You can see them there right now. If you see an article that doesn't have a byline, it was written by the algorithms at, uh, at Narrative Science. And, you know, and can you scale that up? Yeah, you can get books like the 2009-2014 World Outlook for 60 milligram containers of fromage fry, uh, which is, that's the actual price, it's not an error, it's $755. These are books that are auto-assembled by scraping, looking for trends in Google searches and auto-assembling books that are then printed on demand for people who are really interested in fromage fry. Um, the idea that books are being generated without any supervision at all, without any idea. So the idea then that, that then all of these words that are being generated could have effects outside of what you might predict. Um, this, is, uh, this was the tweet uh, when the AP um, uh, Twitter account got hacked, uh, breaking two explosions in the White House, Barack Obama is injured. Not a lot of people really uh, bought into this. Uh, 483 retweets, not a lot. Uh, right? Uh, except that, you know, of course, you've got a bunch of algorithms in the market that are looking at Twitter and parsing what's going on, and there went about 5% of the market right there. Boom. And by the way, who, does anybody know who actually was responsible for this hack? It's the Syrian Electronic Army. Okay, so it's a, it's a division of the pro-Assad army uh, that engages in uh, uh, electronic forms of espionage who hacked the AP Twitter account and eliminated 5% uh, of the market uh, for uh, about 10 minutes or so, uh, uh, just with a tweet, because that's the thing, right, is, is that we're, we're building and we're living in this world that no longer has the human in the loop to kind of say, this is obviously nuts. Right? And the thing is, is, is that like more and more, you know, we've, it's like we've not just left behind human authorship, right, we've also left behind the human reader. You know, so what you see more and more, you know, is if you're a writer uh, for like demand media or the Huffington Post, uh, is you'll see, so this is, uh, this is the CTO of this, uh, the Huffington Post. He spoke in his animated way about SEO and headlines, why nouns are better search terms than verbs. Michael Jackson death, not Michael Jackson dies. The ethos of the HuffPost newsroom was winning the Google search. That was the thrill. Uh, so the idea that it's not just written by machines, it's actually written for machines, right? That the, that the actual grammar of headlines that are in use right now uh, is, not, is no longer optimized for the human reader. It's no longer optimized for grammar, it's optimized for the search, right? Which is essentially the machine, right? And so these, this idea of kind of like machine aesthetics um, of, a, of a kind of like robot readable world. Um, and you can see this in, in all kinds of things, right? So this is, I monitor screenwriting Forums. These are screenwriters who are talking to each other and they're like, can we figure out the epigogics algorithm to make sure that our movies get made? And it's like, mm. so that they look more like every other movie uh, that is actually in the, in the system. It's kind of incredible, right? Because the bottom line is that in a robot readable world, you know, that's where everything's designed for machine legibility, you know, when we change who we write for, it also changes what and how we write. I have a lot more that I could tell you about this, but I'll just, I guess I'll end it on this slide, which is just to say, you know, so, so it's this idea that we're, we're shaping the world for this mode of perception, 
and I could talk endlessly about the ways that it has actually reshaped New York City, like real estate, everything. Um, but I'll end on this because it's just such a, it's such a beautiful example of it. Um, this, is, um, this is a car, this is in Poland, um, and I'll just take it back to the, to the sort of through line of this. Um, uh, this is as a result of uh, the introduction of um, uh, automated ticketing systems, right? So uh, you, you've seen these, right? There's like a, there's like a camera in the light, uh, in the traffic light, and so if you go through the red light, it just automatically takes a picture of your license plate and sends you a ticket in the mail. Um, and that was in order to uh, gain far greater efficiency. You don't have to deploy as many police. Um, and so, and it, in a way, you can look at this in a, in a longer history, which is that you know, it used to be that people would speed and then the police developed radar. And so the p drivers developed uh, anti-radar, right? They developed radar detectors, right? And so, so the police developed a camera uh, to say, okay, never mind your anti-radar detectors. We'll just grab your license plate. And so here it is in Poland. Here's a car that has replaced its license plate with code. This is uh, in particular a SQL injection hack. Uh, this is a way to attack a database uh, and say, whatever it is you just read, delete it. Um, <laughs> okay, so the idea, uh, uh, and which, by the way, works. Um, uh, this is a t fully functional hack. Um, uh, and so the idea that, that the physical world starts to shape itself and that individual behavior starts to shape itself, not just to accommodate this new way of seeing that is not human, but actually to, uh, in a way, co-evolve, right? To like, to like, to like engage, engage with it, you know, in a, in a form of like natural synthesis. It's, uh, uh, it's sort of beautiful and sort of alarming. Um, uh, and uh, I don't have time to go into all the details of it, but, um, but I, I, I'll leave you with this image. Um, uh, and if you ever see this car, uh, you know, shake, shake this man's hand. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thanks very much, okay. <laughs> Thank you.